Ready? Here we go. So, now we're just going to use uh, a demo of uh, yeah. a Poplon framework using Trojan Script. Yes. Uh, yeah. I think the backstory for this, I think it's kind of timely because uh, it's the time of the year where we're going to have the uh, Hour of Code. So, I think December 7th to the 15th is uh, CS Education Week. and. Um, one of the activities is the Hour of Code and uh, the number of places in Singapore where this is organized. So this is sort of this thing got started uh, last year when I volunteered at the Science Center for the Hour of Code. So I was thinking of um, a thing to um, try to teach the students who come by something about uh, writing programs that play games. So uh, game playing artificial intelligence programs, kind of a side interest of mine. Um, so okay, I thought okay, let's let's try playing tic tac toe then because that's maybe most games that uh, kids know. So you don't have to explain to them what the game is. But then the question is, um, how would you get them to create a tic tac toe program, right? Because these are really like primary school children; they don't really know, they can't really type. I mean, they don't have like the hand eye coordination to even like type. So how would you ask them to create a program to play tic tac toe? And eventually, I came up with the idea that we can design a tic-tac-toe AI with a set of rules, which is uh, what you see over here. And it, it looks quite complex, but uh, actually, so we just have like two rules at the top, which are sort of built in to every AI. So they're sort of for free. You don't have to design that one. Uh, and, and intuitively, just you know, if you can win in this current step, uh, I win. If I can't win, but the opponent's going to win, then block the opponent. Uh, otherwise, I try to place in uh, a square if it's empty, right? So you can have a uh, you know, sort of place in the lower left and so on. And you can actually represent the last uh, nine rules with uh, just a just a grid. So, so you put a one means uh, if this you check this square first. If this square is empty, you would, you would place uh, your mark there. And if that is occupied, you try to place in the you know the second the square number two and so on. So the first two rules combined with these nine rules gives you a complete tic-tac-toe playing program. Does that make sense? So this will be able to play as a, as a, as a program. Uh, OK, so, um, so I thought what, what would be some way for us to evaluate or study like how, how well. Of course, we could sort of play with the, the students or the visitors interactively. Right? They ask them to design a program, essentially by filling in nine numbers. And then you want to sort of, you can ask them to play uh, with you and you can ask them to try to simulate the program, which is kind of nice for thinking about how the sort of rule-based uh, system works. But I thought it'd be interesting to also uh, do some uh, uh, computational study of the, of the rules. Make, can we find some metrics? Can we evaluate these AIs and come up with some numbers? So I wrote a sort of closure program to do that, uh, which I'll try to show you now. So. Um, so it's just a normal closure program. There's a there's a function that uh, it's a problem with line, right? You don't, the REPL just takes forever. Okay, so there's a function called check that reads. Uh, I just used a really dumb reads a description of the nine rules at the back. Seven, eight, nine. That's a sort of a matrix notation, and uh, it just outputs uh, some statistics. So that's, this is not a very good. So we test both the, your, your program as first player and as second player, because that makes a difference. Uh, and we calculate the number of win, lose, and draws uh, against sort of all possible uh, moves by the opponent. So the opponent, we consider all the possible ways the opponent could move, and then apply your program, and then do the opponent, and so on. Uh, actually, turns out there are some actually interesting statistics from this. So, for example, we managed to find some interesting programs which we could use as like a like a, uh, a challenge to the students. You can, you can give them one where we know that it has exactly one way to lose uh, when going first. You can ask them to find, okay, what's that way to, to win the, the AI and so on. Okay.
so fast forward, uh, I wanted to um, make this a little bit more interactive. So right now, it's very hard to, to show this because you have, I have to like, have a REPL and I have to type in this for, for, the, for the visitors. So uh, that's why I started to think, think of creating a front end. Uh, and hopefully, let me show you the front end. That's sort of what came out of the, that exercise. So it's basically what you saw just now, but uh, now it's sort of on a website. Uh, yeah. Um, so you would, now they can sort of do it themselves. It becomes more DIY. So they don't have, I don't have to be there sort of operating the REPL. So basically, they would uh, type in the, the, the matrix or the, the rules, and then it would show the, uh, the result on the right. So we can just sort of change it and just make sure it actually is working. Yeah, I think the numbers at the bottom changed. Um, so actually, this takes a while to compute. Uh, it's not instantaneous because it, it sort of brute force checks all the possible um, uh, lines of play. OK, so this is actually built using um, something called Hoflon, which is also by the same uh, folks that uh, developed Boot, uh, which we heard earlier. So actually, I'll talk a little bit more about how this is done in Hoflon. And uh, uh, yeah, how, how Boot is used to to do the development. OK, so the next part of it, we're just talking about the, uh, I'll go through actually the, the Hoflon getting started tutorial. So if you ever saw that, this is basically the same thing. And I'll talk about how I actually built this particular sort of front end, which is fairly simple. OK, so let's get to the demo. Um, so we don't need this anymore. So I have a Hoflon demo project, which is also on GitHub. Uh, so right, so this is what you get if you do a, you can see, right? So if you do a, unfortunately, you're going to get bootstrap using line. So you can say line new Hoflon, and then a folder name. In this case, line new Hoflon. Uh, in this case, I typed line new Hoflon, Hoflon demo. And in, uh, essentially, you get this structure. Um, so you can see there's boot.properties, which just says like the versions of boot that uh, you're using. Then you have a build.boot file. Um, so boot, it's more like make in a sense. You have you can declare task and task have a um, series of different things you want to do. So I think the dev task you have like you know surf the surf web server. Um, so Hoflon compiles the Hoflon files. Um, then then CLJS compiles um, the files to JavaScript. You have a live reloading. Then you have sort of uh, checking for changes. So let's just um, see how this works. So I'm going to start um, boot dev, which is, um, oh no. So I only have one terminal. So I'll, I'll start boot dev on a different terminal uh, so that I don't tie up my terminal. Um, sorry, this is too small to see, but uh, ignore that. Uh, Hoflon demo. So just run boot dev. So boot dev essentially starts that, all those tasks. So I'm going to edit the. Uh, page. So this is the scary bit. Okay, so and boot dev also takes a little while to get going. Is it working? Okay, yeah. Uh, yeah, so you see that actually, so in Hoflon you write your pages as .hl files, they call it hlisp, uh, and Hoflon itself compiles that to a cljs file. And then hands over to the closure script compiler, which compiles it to the JavaScript files. Okay, sorry, just need to wait for the. Ah, never mind. The problem is this laptop is. Okay, oh. Uh, oh, wait, sorry, I think I screwed up somewhere. So I have two versions of Hoflon, they're trying to bind to the same port. So. Could do that all over again. But anyway, let, let me just t t walk through what the what the H H H L file looks like. So this is the default. Uh, you don't get the comments at the bottom, but this, this is the default um, index. Cljs. H L file you get. So the reason I used Hoflon was because um, it's actually a lot easier to get started. I think if you don't have any front end experience like myself. So I'm I'm mostly a, a back end developer. Uh, so I'm, like I worked in Java, Scala, Clojure. So not really. Try closure script. So this is like the first closure script um, sort of experience. Um, 
and I wanted to build something like a static HTML page, which is really simple. So Hoflon seems to fit the bill in terms of building a very simple static page. Um, so the page directive is very much like the NS um, uh, directive in Clojure. Uh, this is a Hoflon thing. It's not a Clojure script thing. And in Hoflon, you construct the HTML with um, uh, HTML functions. So you can see the you know this head, HTML head, and body, and so on. Hopefully, we can see the page. So, um, right. Okay. So this is what you get. Um, so if you go to the website, it shows you this page. Okay. So the thing about Hoflon is uh, it integrates with another library called Javelin, which is, uh, I guess, it's kind of easy to describe as um, spreadsheet programming or functional reactive programming if you're the academic type. So I think the demo goes if you, if you can define a a cell. This is exactly like a a cell in I think the analogy is really they are using the analogy of a spreadsheet. So in a spreadsheet you have a normal cell, right? So you could declare this cell. Then you can uh, include it in your uh, HTML. So, right. Notice I didn't have to refresh, right? Because, because they're, they're doing the um, automatic reloading via WebSockets. So you see the value of the cell. So that seems kind of boring. Um, so you can actually interact with the cell. Uh, with a button, um, click swap. The so cell is a kind of like an atom. Um, so we can say swap click ink. Okay. So this just uh, applies the ink function on the cell. So if you, uh, well, what you would expect, uh, it increments the button. Right? So I think the thing to say is that it, it's, it doesn't require that much code to get some kind of simple interactivity going on uh, in Hoflon. So you know, unless it's just, just declared the HTML and I declared that, uh, you know, I just obviously ha have a handler that says when you click the button, it, it uh, performs, it runs this closure function, or closure script function. So that's kind of nice. Um, what else? Uh, I think there's a mouse over effect you can do. It's also part of the tutorial. So, uh, if I, yeah, it loses the state, unfortunately. So if you mouse over the number, it uh, goes down. Uh, not fantastic, but yeah, just to show that you can do some other things besides click. Um, what else? Okay, here, and here's where it sort of gets uh, more interesting. Okay, so you can declare something called formula cells. Click uh, even, question mark. And that is constructed the cell equal uh, function. So, so I think you can say even, question mark, click. Hope I got that right. Then you can uh, render that uh, to text. Even so, there's a sort like of templating language in there that uh, works with the text macro. Um, right? Did I close all my? Yeah, missed one. Okay, let's see if that works. So yeah, right? So what happens is the click even um, cell, it's called a formula cell, and it depends on um, the click cell because it uses the click cell in the, uh, in the expression. So Hoflon, or rather Javelin, uh, figures that out and knows like it will update click even automatically when click changes. Notice um, we only change click, right? I mean, in our functions, we only update the value of click. 
and click even is calculated for us automatically. Just like in a, in a spreadsheet, right? If you have a formula in a cell, and if you change one of the dependent cells, the, f the value of the formula gets updated automatically. And that is exactly what they were going for, which I thought was a very nice, simple analogy. If you're building a not too complicated website like I was doing. OK, um, what else? You can have further, like, uh, more complicated stuff, like, like colors that depends on the click, the, the evenness of the click. So maybe color uh, is a cell equal um, if, uh, oh no, click even, red, uh, blue, otherwise red. Oh, sorry. Thank you. Then we can s style the text. Uh, style cell equal stir color colon color. Oh. Right, something like that. Fingers crossed. So, so the uh, the property of the the text. The color property depends on the uh, evenness of the value, right? And what else? Making a sequence. Oh, this is where it gets complex. <laughs> okay, so uh, we can also track the history of the. Unfortunately, it doesn't. It doesn't do that for you automatically. The history of the values. You would think that it does record the history, but it it doesn't really. Um, but you could you could do it yourself. So um, this part is going to be the part I always forget. So I'm just going to cheat. OK. It has to be a cell, right? Forgotten. OK. So uh, history is a cell that initially is the empty vector. And then you can, uh, this is a Hofflon function, at watch, that um, it's called whenever the value of clicks change, uh, then this is the sort of the var that is going to be modified. And then this is the modification function. And I guess the, uh, the percent three is the new value, uh, oh, sorry, is the old value of the uh, uh, of clicks, which is the one we are watching. We are watching the, the cell clicks. Oh, click. Oh, click. Why is it called clicks? Maybe it was always called clicks, and I just wrangled the name. Okay, it's always called. Never mind. It's called click now. It, uh, yeah. In the in the in the in the tutorial, it's called clicks, but you know, you can just mentally map it to click. Okay. Um, yeah. Thanks. Otherwise, that wouldn't have worked. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah. So that's the history, and I think we need one more thing to sort of render the history, which I'll also just copy from here because I'm lazy to type. The only thing that's a little bit odd is that for, for the, uh, hmm, what happened? For re generating DOM elements in a loop, the recommended way in Hoflon is to use the loop template macro. I, I'm not quite sure I understand exactly why that is. Um, I think they were saying something like the DOM nodes are not garbage collected. So if you generate them in, in a map, um, it end up, with, end up with a lot of DOM nodes because, it, it, as you can sort of see, it actually keeps updating the DOM as you, as you change the values of the cells. So the recommend, recommended method is to use the loop TPL macro, uh, and then it takes uh, bindings, uh, and which is like a kind of like a for loop, right, or do seek kind of thing. So um, n loops over the history. It generates li nodes, which is a formula cell with the string n was. Something. And yeah. Uh, so let's see that works. So if I save that. Right. So n was zero. N was well what happened? Why did it disappear? Okay. Yeah. So that's just uh more. Yeah. And I think the last step, the last element is just to show that you can actually Again, it's kind of complex. I wouldn't type it on the spot. Um, it's kind of the same thing, except um, we also generate a background color 
um, sometimes you might like it's like a table. You might like it to alternate between two colors. So here we just use regular closure stuff. So we cycle between EEE and FFF, and we create a a, a list of pairs, right? Which is a formula cell, and then the list of pairs is the background color and the number, and we generate the. I'll just delete the earlier one because it's the same thing. So, ooh, okay, I screwed up somewhere. No? Seems to be fine. Now we have to do a refresh. There isn't the color. Maybe I really screwed up somewhere. Yeah. Yeah. Which line is it? Line 27? Is it the same line? Hopefully. Yeah, just two up. So, oh yeah, this is because the OL had the additional two. Yeah, okay, as you see, the, it reloaded, right? So you may not be able to see the background, actually. It's rather faint. It's just uh, so the application of styling and... Uh, I guess here, you just have to be careful. Like You have to make sure that you use the cell equal formula that ensures that it regenerates all the values correctly when you update the sort of the model, which is in this case just a single cell. Of course, your model can be a lot more complex, like an um, like a tree of you know stuff. So here in this simple demo, it's just a single number. Okay, so that's the demo, which is essentially the getting started tutorial. So now I'll show you the um, the actual program, the that you saw just now. Um, where's that? That's TTT, which is pretty much the same thing, except the index file is different. So, yeah. Okay, so here you see a more complex version of the page macro, which is showing its NS roots. So you can say, you know, refer closure, require. Obviously, this is a bit more complex. I needed a bit more libraries. Uh, so I, use, I also required my um, tic tac toe logic, which is in TTT.core. So, oh, and also here I'm showing the, the macro version of the uh, def cell. So in saying def something cell, you can say def c, which means def cell. It's like def n, it's def sure. fn. Yeah, it's just a macro. It's all macros, right? It's a macros. Uh, but it's def something cell something, right? So, but it's def cell. Uh, these are just the three lines of the, the, the program because there are three input sections. Uh, then there's the text, and then the, this is the slow part. So this is the def cell equal, which is the formula cell, which is def c equal as a shortcut. Uh, this is the statistics, right? The how many wins, how many loses. Uh, so this is this computation, which is actually a bit slow. Uh, yeah. Um, so in Hoffman, you can just declare, you can just con return um, DOM nodes from functions as well. So if you have some repetitive DOM structure, you can define a function and then just return the, um, uh, the DOM node as the, the result. Um, so here's the actual sort of the business logic where it actually does the update. Um, so in this case, I want to actually update all the three cells, the prop one, two, and three are the three lines of the program. I want to update them at the same time. Uh, that's why I'm doing it in, in the do sync block. Uh, here I'm just doing a reset because I want to just stick the, the new value, right? And I also change the text. Uh, and yeah, here's just a, like a small trick to do the actual update stats uh, in a separate loop so that the, the DOM actually gets refreshed. So you see the, the please wait and then the slow update happens uh, later. So it doesn't, it doesn't block the, the, the rendering. And this is just the rest of the HTML, which is, the, I guess, here I'm just showing you can actually use like, um, like Bootstrap, for example. If you put the CSS in the Assets folder, uh, here it's referring Bootstrap CSS, using some Bootstrap um, classes just to make things look a little bit nicer. Uh, and have this two column format, which is really hard to do otherwise in, in HTML. Um, what else? So yeah, I mean, Quite standard. So there's an input field, which is a thing I defined earlier. Actually, it's a function, it returns a, a input type, 
uh, text box and think this is the default value. And this is the ID of the uh, field which we need to use later to extract the, the string to uh, push to the computation. Um, yeah, and then the, the actual button that does the, the update, that, that will actually do the reset into the cell. So that means as you type, it doesn't change. It's only when you click the button. And then, yeah, so this is just to render the results, right? So using the text macro to extract the, uh, to compose a text string that, like the, the human readable description and the, the value inside the, the structure, which is called stat, which is the formula cell. So stat was a formula cell. And here we are uh, extracting a, a nested structure, right? So get in stat as first, so win as the first player, lose and draw and so on, and as the second player, win, lose and draw. So I think this is still running, right? So pretty much what you saw, yeah, I think this is still, is this still running? No, because I had to kill that to run the other thing. So let me just go back to that one. Um, boot. So there's also a boot um, prod, I think, that generates the static HTML and CSS files, which is actually what I use uh, for the actual demo. So I generate the static files and just upload them to some static hosting. So it's just basically two, well, three files. I mean, I have the CSS, which is essentially bootstrap.css. Um, so doing the boot stuff, it seems like it's faster now. So yeah, it's just this laptop is a bit slow. But anyway, once it got started, it's actually fast. That's a typical JVM problem. Ah, OK. So basically what you saw just now, I think. Yeah. So maybe just some interesting things I learned. Uh, well, maybe not so much from the, the front end stuff, but it's actually possible to design an AI, in this case, that never loses when it goes first. So you can actually obtain lose equal to 0. Uh, over here, if you can see that. So, so for lose, you can actually get something like zero. Unfortunately, it's not possible to obtain both lose zero. It's not possible to obtain lose zero as a second player. So, uh, of course, it's an interesting question as to what is the most defensive possible AI you can write, in the sense that it has the smallest number of losers. Um, let's say the sum, the first as first player and as second player. I'll leave that as an exercise. Uh, for you to think about. <laughs> okay, so that's pretty much all I have actually. Yeah. Well, Questions? How did, they, how did the kids define that? Actually, quite well, I think. Um, so, for example, I, I actually presented. So, during the hour of code, I didn't have a chance to do this because it was all the rapple. So, I managed to show this during Maker Fair, which was um, like middle of the year. And we had a running, like a, we had a little running contest going on where I record down. Like maybe like what is the highest win for the day or something like that, and then they try to like beat that uh, value. You know, so whoever comes by to see this demo, ask them to key in their AI, and like we can calculate, and then you can see like did you beat like the highest win for today, and you get some a small prize or something. And I think the more interesting part actually uh, is the is the first part, which I didn't show you here, which is actually the interaction with the the visitors. You can ask them to. Um, so first of all, you can show them how it works by you play against them, right? So they'll play like as themselves, then you like be the AI, right? You simulate the computer, and then you ask them to do the same thing. So you ask them to write, and you ask them to simulate the, the AI. And then the most interesting part is you uh, then you play using their program, and you ask them to beat it, find the sort of find the like debug, find the bug almost, right? Because it's you, you really ruined the entire generation. Of kids that, so. <laughs> <laughs> well. Uh, <I'm> sorry. <laughs> So it's pretty interesting, especially the part where you ask them to try to find a way to beat their own program, yeah. which is kind of, I guess for me, that was, I was trying to get the idea of like debugging, right? You're finding like the weak points, right? Because we can see that, oh, there are some ways you could lose, right? Because they would think it's invincible, right? They think, oh, this can never lose, right? But then you can run it in the program and you can show up here. Actually, we found that there's like this number of ways that your program could be beaten. Could you find one of them? So that gives them a little flavor of like a debugging, hopefully. I don't know. I mean, that's just sort of. But one thing I realized that was not so good is it's, it's fairly opaque in a sense, how would you see, how would you improve an existing program? So if you have a program, how would you tell how, how you could make it better? So this format is actually kind of opaque. 
it's kind of hard to say if I swap the numbers here, what's going to happen? Like you can't really think about it. Yeah, I mean you can run it through this, but you know, still, yeah. This is a question yeah. regarding the component itself. Yeah. Um, so we saw that it, it's refreshing the values. It yeah. Can make the values. Yeah. And I, I the question is, how does it figure out which values have been changed? Is it, is it an event loop? Is it, uh, does it add some listeners to the, to the values? It's probably a listener, I think. And the, the refresh is probably just like a virtual DOM uh, update. I think there was a really good talk on Hufflon, which I'll refer you to, because I'm not going to do a good job of um, explaining it. So I think at Clojure uh, this year, uh, Mitchell Niskin, I think, is actually from Edzerk, the people who built uh, Boot and Hoplon. Um, so I think what it does is actually builds a dependency graph uh, between the, um, the formula cells and the cells. And it makes sure it performs all the updates before it calls for a, a, a redraw, essentially. Yeah. So you can actually have a quite a complex graph of quite a complex graph of dependencies between your inputs, the, the normal cells and formula cells. And it performs all the updates and then calls for the uh, DOM update. Yeah. But I seriously haven't built a really big application in it, so I can't really say it, it would be performant. Yeah. So this, as you can see, is all pretty small apps. Yeah. So Hoflon. Actually, Hoflon has changed quite a bit. So this is like version 6. I was using version 5. Uh, I had to um, change some stuff to get it to work. Yeah. So you can. I, I feel they added this. They added quite a bit of stuff in the in the last since I checked. So there's the dev element thing, which wasn't around the last time I looked at it. Uh, you can see the live update here, which is kind of nice. So you can actually have state in. Not sure you want to do that, but you can actually have state if you want in in each element individually. So here, basically, each element is tracking uh, the start time separately, right? Yeah. What are the uh, page based web frameworks out there right now? What the what? Sorry. The you know the types of web frameworks where you basically say dev page. Uh, like you said that this was easier to use because it was easier for non designer to use. Which are the other ones you looked at? Uh, I, I looked at Reagent as well. I think um, I talked about Reagent. And obviously, you know, Ohm uh, and all this other stuff. So those actually seem rather complex. I mean, you have to like build a component, and then you got to you know hook the component up, and then the component has all these functions they got to implement, like render, and so on. So uh, so it seems a bit overkill for what I was trying to do. I was just trying to build a very simple page with a simple like click the button and this thing updates. That's it, right? So. Uh, so to me, that uh, half long was simpler because I could just express the HTML, you know, in, as a Lisp structure, as you know, and then just have that the data sort of embedded uh, in there, and then it just updates for you. Um, yeah. So obviously, I think if you have a complicated app, you definitely want to perhaps have components. I would think that definitely helps. Yeah. Have you looked at Pedestal? Sorry. Have you looked at Pedestal? No, I have not. Yeah. But that's still, I think, it's more of a back end. Yeah. I'm not sure they have a front end story. They, they did, but they okay. deprecated it. Okay. Of, you know, all the yeah. Ah, okay. Right, right. Oh, yeah. Okay. All right. Thank you so much. Yeah. Okay.